The EU is undemocratic. The EU is too slow. The EU is too bureaucratic. These are some of the most common accusations people have against the EU. And they are not all wrong. Firstly, the EU's election process for its presidents isn't clear. And yes, there are multiple roles with that title. This has caused confusion, leading to the saying, who do I call if I want to call Europe? Emphasizing the uncertainty about who truly leads the organization. Furthermore, EU decision-making can indeed be slow. For example, since September 2020, member states have been trying to agree on a migration and asylum policy. And despite the efforts, it has not yet passed, with all 27 countries having different views. Additionally, the bureaucracy in the EU is infamous for its extensive regulations, which some argue stifle innovation and flexibility. But is this all about to change? Two years ago, during the Conference on the Future of Europe, EU citizens demanded comprehensive EU reform. Today, a pivotal reform proposal is finally set to be debated in the European Parliament on the 20th to 23rd of November. Here at EU Made Simple, we're buzzing with excitement. We've always been very vocal about the nitty-gritty challenges the European Union faces, from how we elect our president to the constant hurdle of country vetoes. And guess what? This fresh proposal could be the breakthrough we've been waiting for. This video will unravel the three big highlights of this groundbreaking proposal and give you an idea of the road ahead. The first big shift in this proposal is reshaping the EU institutions by giving the Parliament and the Council of the EU equal power in decision making. Let me explain. The EU currently has three major institutions in the lawmaking process. Firstly, the European Commission. Think of it as the EU's idea factory, where fresh EU law proposals are born, with a president, currently Ursula von der Leyen, at the helm. Secondly, there's the European Parliament, which is essentially our voice in the EU. We elect its members, and they're responsible for discussing, tweaking, and voting on those law ideas from the European Commission. Thirdly, we have the Council of the EU. Picture it as an elite club, where each EU country is represented by a minister. They too have a say, diving into debates and casting their votes on the proposals. For any new law to make the cut, both the Parliament and the Council need to be on board. On key decisions, however, the Council plays the main role, while the Parliament is only asked to give an opinion or approve what has already been decided. Obviously, this is a super quick overview with a lot of simplification, so if you would like more detail, check out my playlist on the European Union Explained, linked above. So what are the proposed changes? Let's start with the European Commission. Today, the EU Commission has 27 commissioners, one from each country, including one president, called the President of the European Commission. In the proposal, the EU Commission will get a sleeker look with a new name executive, only 15 commissioners, and a name change for the president to President of the Union. The president gets to handpick their team, as long as it's geographically and demographically balanced. Next, there's a European Parliament. Today, the EU Parliament has limited power. It can't propose new laws and has a minimal role in choosing the Commission president. However, the proposal empowers the European Parliament, granting it the authority to finally propose new laws in tandem to the Commission. Furthermore, the European Parliament would also get more say in the election of the Commission president, as they will be granted the ability to nominate the candidate. This would mark a pivotal shift. Currently, the European Commission president is selected behind closed doors by the 27 EU leaders. Critics have questioned how democratic this process is, and allowing more involvement of the Parliament will make this process more transparent. The EU leaders will not be left out completely, though, as they still need to approve the nomination by a qualified majority. With a new proposal, the Parliament would also be granted the power to remove individual commissioners or the entire commission through a simple majority. Today, it is only possible to dismiss the entire commission all at once with a two-thirds majority. Finally, the Parliament will gain the same power as the Council, as they will co-decide on all key EU policies. The EU will then have a bicameral system, where the Parliament will be the Chamber of Citizens and the Council will be the Chamber of States. Next, there's the Council of the EU. Today, the Council of the EU has significant power, particularly in fields like defense, foreign policy, and fiscal matters, thanks to each country's veto power. One of the standout features in the proposal, and honestly, one of my personal favorites, is the idea to scrap vetoes entirely. 
Instead, qualified majority voting, also called QMV, would be used. With QMV, decisions require the agreement of 55% of member states, representing at least 65% of the EU's population, instead of unanimous approval. In my opinion, this would be a huge win for Europe. With leaders like Orban, and potentially Fitzo from Slovakia, the veto currently lets a single country hold the whole of the EU hostage. I touched on three institutions earlier, but there's a fourth impacted by this proposal. Actually, the EU boasts seven institutions, but for this video, we'll focus on these four. Kudos to anyone who can list all seven in the comments, without cheating of course. So the fourth key player is the European Council, which is made up of the EU country leaders alongside a president, steering the EU's overarching strategies. The proposal plans to lessen its decision power, putting the new president of the union in charge, the same president as the European Commission we discussed earlier, meaning there would be one president leading the Commission and the European Council. Interestingly, the proposal also outlines plans for EU-wide referendums on big issues, allowing citizens to have more say. How these votes would work, though, is still up in the air. That wraps up the first major reform focus. Here at the EU Made Simple, we're big fans of this direction, especially the emphasis on electing the president and ditching the vetoes. It tackles two core EU challenges, the democratic gap and the pace of decision making. The proposed reform's second focus is widening the union's competencies. In other words, widening the EU's areas of action. But what does this mean? Competencies outline who does what between the EU and its member states and are grouped into various types. Firstly, there are the exclusive competencies. Only the EU can make laws in these areas. For example, they decide on custom duties or monetary policy for countries using the euro. Secondly, there are the shared competencies. Here, both the EU and its member countries can make decisions. Think of this as teamwork in areas like the environment and energy. Then there are the supporting competencies. Here, the EU can assist member countries, but can't overrule them. This happens in sectors like culture or education. There's also a special category called special competencies, which covers unique cases such as foreign policy. But the main three types give a good overview of how decision making is distributed. Today, the EU and its member states jointly address environmental and biodiversity issues. The new proposal seeks to give the EU sole authority in these areas, allowing for bold goals to combat global warming and protect biodiversity. In areas like public health, civil protection, industry and education, the proposal envisions an elevated role for the EU, transitioning these from supporting to shared competencies. Furthermore, the proposal seeks to expand the Union's joint responsibilities in areas like energy, foreign affairs, defense, external border management, and cross-border infrastructure. Yet it lacks detail specifics on these matters. That wraps up the second major proposed reform highlight. With Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the Israel-Hamas war in the Middle East, we at the EU Made Simple feel it's important for the EU to work together on defense, which is something we will be covering in a future video. So please subscribe if you are interested. The third focus of the proposed reform is to boost the EU's authority in ensuring member states follow EU laws, especially its core values. Presently, there's a mechanism in place known as Article 7, often referred to as the nuclear option. This provision, when triggered, has the power to strip a member state of certain rights, including their voting right, if they are found in breach of essential EU principles. Yet its potency has been undermined by informal political arrangements, like the mutual understanding between Hungary and Poland, where they promise to not use it against each other. To address this, the proposal intends to move the responsibility of triggering this article from the European Council, where it can be vetoed by a single member state, to the more impartial Court of Justice of the European Union. So obviously these are a lot of changes. So what can we expect next? Will this pass? Well, the sponsor of today's video, the Union of European Federalists, or UEF, has given us a roadmap. This uh, proposal has had the support of five political groups of uh, the European Parliament, and it is, it is indeed a proposal for a more federal uh, treaty for Europe. Now, we have the next important challenge, because in the 22, 22nd of November, we will have the plenary vote on this same report. Once it is approved by the European Parliament, there will be another very important step, which is to uh, 
have a majority in the European Council to convene a convention in order to debate this proposal by the European Parliament. To summarize, the European Parliament will cast their vote on this transformative proposal by the 23rd of November. If it gets the green light there, it moves on to the European Council, where it needs to rally a simple majority to keep the momentum going. But it doesn't stop there. If we clear that hurdle, the stage is set for a convention to dive deep into the treaties of the European Union. Then there's the final challenge, achieving unanimity among member states to bring this vision to life. It really is a thrilling journey ahead. This is what we think. We will not hide our opinion that we think that these changes are a good move for the EU, as it gives us more democracy, faster decision making, and a better platform to tackle the world's biggest problems. However, it is a very long road ahead. We feel that it is possible, likely even, that the European Parliament and the European Council will muster a majority to start an EU convention where the treaties can be discussed. But this is where the problems will start. Only 18 months ago, 10 EU countries opposed EU treaty change. And guess what? At the end of the convention, all 27 EU member states need to unanimously agree. And this will be incredibly difficult. A heartfelt shout out to our sponsor UEF. Established in 1946, the Union of European Federalists has been a steadfast advocate for a European federation. UEF is a cross-border, non-governmental political collective of dedicated individuals, both women and men, fervently working towards the vision of a European federation. Please let us know what your favorite reform is in the comments. And please subscribe and like the video if you enjoy the content. And if you want to support us further, please sign up to Patreon. Until next time.